Okay, welcome back. All right. I believe we were talking about Hess's Law last time, and we uh, we all enjoyed uh, doing a couple of those problems. Um, Hess's Law is one way to indirectly calculate delta H without actually having to go into the lab and actually do some work yourself. Uh, and, and it works, but um, it's, uh, it's uh, a bit cumbersome, I guess would be the nice way to put it, maybe. Um, and surely there should be an easier way to, to calculate delta H than Hess's Law. Well, there is. Uh, turns out there's more than one way to kind of skin a cat here. And so another way that you can calculate delta H, which you're going to love this, is much easier, uh, is something called heats of formation. So that's what we'll uh, start on uh, at this point. So let's take a look here. So what exactly is a, a heat of formation anyway? Well, heats of formation uh, is, uh, that's what this little delta H with the little F there is. Uh, this is the delta H when one mole of a compound is formed from its elements in their stable states. And that is at 25 degrees uh, Celsius and one atmosphere pressure. Th those are called standard conditions. And that's what this little circle means up here. It just means all this stuff was measured at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. Because, you know, if you're going to compare a bunch of values, you want to compare apples to apples. You want to compare apples to oranges. So you want to make sure everything is measured at the same temperature and pressure. Because that might have an effect. And so we use 25 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, roughly room temperature, and one atmosphere of pressure, which is roughly room pressure. And so that's a situation you encounter a lot. All right, so for example, uh, here's an equation for you. Uh, I could take two moles of silver. I can react that with uh, Cl2 here, a mole of Cl2. I can make two moles of silver chloride. Delta H for this reaction is negative 254.0 uh, kilojoules. All right, so given that, what is the heat of formation for silver chloride? Well, it's negative 127 kilojoules per mole. Why is it negative 127? Well, because look at the definition. The heat of formation is the delta H when one mole of a compound is formed from its elements in their stable states. Are we forming silver chloride from, their, from its elements in their stable states? Yes. But we're forming two moles of silver chloride. And this is the heat given off. Heat of formation is when I form one mole. And so if I form two moles and give off this much heat, if I only form one mole, half as much, it ought to be what? Half as much heat, and there's the 127. So for every one mole of silver chloride you form, 127 mole, uh, 127 kilojoules of heat's given off, kilojoules per mole. All right? Okay, well, what about this one? This is uh, mercury oxide. Uh, mercury oxide will decompose into liquid mercury and a half a mole of oxygen. Delta H for this reaction is uh, positive 90.8 kilojoules. Endothermic or exothermic? Endothermic, positive delta H, heat taken in. You have to add heat to decompose the mercury oxide. What is, given that equation, what is the heat of formation for mercury oxide? Well, it's negative 90.8 kilojoules per mole. Why? Well, remember, heat of formation is when you form one mole of a, of a compound from its elements in their stable states. All right, here I'm decomposing. What I'm really interested in is the opposite equation. Mercury plus a half a mole of O2 gives me mercury oxide. See, this reverse equation, wouldn't that be forming one mole of mercury oxide from its elements in their stable states? All right, well, if I want the reverse equation, what would the delta H for that be? Well, remember, flip the equation around, change the sign, and that's why it's negative 90.8 kilojoules per mole. All right, and that's where you get it from. All right? Heats of formations for compounds are usually negative. Okay, I said usually. <laughs> usually they're negative. In other words, heat's given off when a compound is formed. Why? Why are heats of formations usually negative? Well, it all comes back to this... this overarching principle that I think we have mentioned before somewhere along the way. Uh, why do things react in the first place? You know, how come when I take beaker A and mix it with beaker B that, you know, it starts to turn green and fizz and, and does something? Well, the reason compounds form is the atoms are happier together. By happy, I mean lower in energy. 
than they were apart. So when elements come together, they have, let's say, this much energy, okay, when they're apart. But when they come together, now they're lower in energy, so they only have this much energy. Well, you can't create energy, you can't destroy energy. So where does this excess energy go? Well, quite often, that excess energy is given off in the form of heat. So I start with this much energy, my compound forms, and the excess energy is just given off in the form of heat. And that's why heats of formations generally tend to be negative. They tend to be exothermic reactions. Now, did I say they were always negative? No. Sometimes they're positive. Sometimes heat is actually added. So why is that? Well, you must not know the whole story, right? I must not be telling you the whole story. Uh, otherwise, you could they would always be negative. And you're right, I'm not telling you the whole story. Uh, and I will tell you the whole story if you will pay me some more money next semester. And we'll talk about the whole thing. But generally speaking, heats of formations typically tend to be negative. You actually have already calculated a heat of formation. Uh, if you'll go back to our last video, when we did our little Hess's Law problems here, well, it turns out, look at this. Here's carbon plus a half a mole of oxygen goes to CO. Isn't that delta H just the heat of formation for carbon monoxide? You're forming one mole from its elements in their stable states. So yeah, the heat of formation for, C, for carbon monoxide is 100, negative 110.5 kilojoules per mole. Um, you've actually calculated that without even knowing it. You know, really, I mean, look at this. Here's N2O5. Isn't this forming one mole of N2O5 from its elements in their free states? Stable states? Yeah, sure is. So, yeah, you actually calculated the heat of formation for N2O5 when you did this Hess's Law problem. Notice this one actually is positive. It's positive 11.3 kilojoules. It's endothermic. And again, there there is a reason why. And we will we'll come back to it. We'll talk about it next semester. But generally speaking, they tend to be negative. And but if you look in the chart, you're going to see a you know a lot of uh, a lot of different um, a, a lot of different ones that do happen to be positive. All right, heats of formation. Uh, these are these are ones I will give you. Uh, you don't have to memorize all the you don't have to memorize the heat of formation for mercury oxide. No one's going to ask you to do that. You know you can look that up. So where in the world am I going to be able to look that up? Well why you have a book. So here's what you need to do. Uh, you need to take your book and go down to the appendix and you're looking for standard thermodynamic properties for selected cell. You want appendix G. So you're going to click on that. And look at that. Here's a, here's a chart. Okay. And what you'll see is you'll see uh, heats of formation here. You'll see this uh, delta G of formation. Uh, and then you'll see this uh, delta, or this S of formation here as well. Don't get too worried about these columns over here. We're going to come back. We're going to pick those up next semester. We're going to talk about what they are and how we use them. All you really need to be concerned with is this left-hand column at this point right here. And these are heats of formations for uh, elements and compounds in their stable states at 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere. Standard conditions is what we call it. Okay, and just whole charts full. If you need this information on a test, which by the way you will, I'll just tell you, uh, I'll give it to you. you. You don't have to memorize this chart. No one's going to make you memorize this chart. Okay, I will give you all the heats of formation except two things. All right, so what are those two things? Well, the heat of formation for any element in its stable state is zero. So therefore, the heat of formation for, say, carbon is zero. The heat of formation for oxygen is zero. The heat of formation for helium is zero. The heat of formation for iron metal is zero. All right, that I won't give to you. You have to know the heat of formation for that is zero. Why is it zero? Well, we'll think about it. It, it actually makes sense. Um, if I wanted to form, let's say for I wanted, I wanted to know the heat of formation for iron metal. Well, by the very definition, it is the delta H when one mole of a compound is formed from its elements in their stable states. 
So if I'm forming one mole of iron metal, what am I going to make it from? Well, I'm going to make it from one mole of iron metal. So essentially, I've got one mole of iron metal goes to one mole of iron metal. What's delta H for that reaction? What's zero? Because you didn't do anything. It's you just it just went from iron metal to iron metal. So there's not going to be heat being taken in or given off there. So common sense tells you the heat of formation for that is is going to be zero. All right. And if you look in the chart again, you're going to see that. Look at the zeros. Okay. Here's bromine liquid. See zero. Cadmium metal zero. Calcium metal zero. Lots and lots and lots of zeros here. There's chlorine gas zero. See. So if it's an element in its free state, it's going to be zero. You have to know that. I'm not going to give you that. All right. But if it's a compound, it's got a heat of formation. Okay? There's another exception to the rule. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So if you're making uh, compounds maybe from elements in their free states, then I guess heats of formation are going to be really useful to you, right? But we don't always do that. There's a whole lot of other chemical reactions we do besides just making uh, compounds from elements in their free states. Well, that's okay because it turns out that for any thermochemical equation, you know, whether you're making a compound from its elements or whatever, any thermochemical equation that you can find, the delta H for that reaction is equal to the sum of the heats of formation of your products minus the sum of the heats of formations for your reactants. And that's a, that's a big deal. I would put a star by that one uh, because this is very simple to calculate, which makes it very, very useful. You're going to need to know how to do this, trust me. And you're going to want this. You want to see these problems on the test. You, you don't want to see 25 Hess's Law problems. You want to see some of these, like free points almost. Almost. All right? And, of course, the heat of formation for any element in stable state is equal to zero. All right, so what does this sum of, sum of, sum of, delta, whatever, what does all this mean? Well, it's, it's, it's easier than you think. So let's, let's do a problem. Okay, so calculate delta H for the following reaction. So I've got uh, CH4, that's methane gas, that's natural gas, plus uh, O2, two O2s. Uh, goes to CO2 and goes to, to liquid waters. The state of matter does matter here, so be careful. Well, notice that we're not forming a, a compound from its elements free states, but I can still use heat of formation here. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, okay, we're going to take the sum of, and that's what this little sigma means, just means add, add them together, the heat of formation of your products. Where are your products in a chemical equation? They're on the right-hand side. Right-hand side. Where are my reactants in the chemical equation? They're on the left-hand side. All right. So it's right-hand side minus left-hand side. Not left minus right. Right-hand minus left. You could almost think of it like final minus initial. You know, delta H, delta, remember we said we have a delta that's always final minus initial? Well, you can kind of think of your products as your final, what you made, and your reactants is kind of your initial, what you started with. But it's always final minus initial, products minus reactants. If you get that mixed up, you're going to miss every single one of those questions on the test. You're going to get the wrong sign. So, you know, don't make that mistake. Here's how we're going to start it out. We're going to say, okay, some of the heat formations of my products. So where are my products? Well, that would be the CO2, and that would be the water. So what we're going to do is we're going to look up the heat of formation for the CO2 in the back of the book. We're going to write it down. Okay. Plus, we're going to look up the heat of formation for liquid water, not gaseous water, not, not uh, solid water, but liquid water. And we're going to multiply that by 2. And the reason why is heat of formations are given in kilojoules per mole. In other words, for every one mole that I make. But in this case, I've got two moles. So I just simply take the heat of formation and multiply it by two. All right. And then we're going to add those together. That's, that's what the little sigma means. Okay. Then we're going to take the heats of formations of my reactants. Okay. So what do I have as reactants here? Well, I've got CH4. So I'm going to look up the heat of formation for CH, CH4 in the back of the book. Plus I've got two O2s. So I'm going to look up the heat of formation for O2. 
and I'm going to multiply it by 2 because of the 2 out here in front. See, whatever you've got coefficient-wise, multiply your heat of formation times that. And then I'm going to add those two together because that's what this sum of means right here. Okay? So heats of form, sum of the heats of formations of my products, right-hand side, minus the sum of the heats of formations of my reactants. Okay? Now, is there anything here I know the heat of formation of before I start looking in the back of the book? Well, I know the heat of formation of the oxygen is what? Well, that's zero. Why is it zero? Because that's oxygen in its free state, the way you normally find it. See? And so if I multiply that by two, I don't care. It's still zero. Two times zero is still zero. Um, and so, yeah, I know that's zero. So I don't have to look that one up. The rest of these are not zero. They actually have a value. So I've got to look that up. So I'm going to go to the back of the book here. And I'm going to say, okay, CO2. There we go. Yeah, you, you guys don't realize how much scrolling I actually edited out of this video. <laughs> but there it is right there, CO2. And that's that negative 393.51 right here. Okay, and that's, that's uh, where that number comes from right there. And I'm going to look up the heat of formation for liquid water. So that would be H2O. Okay, we're looking for the liquid one, not the aqueous or the gaseous, because that's what it says in the equation. And that's uh, negative 285.83. Negative 283, uh, 5.83, that's this number right here, multiply that by 2, okay, minus, we know this is 0, look up the heat, heat of formation for CH4, okay, here we are, and that's negative 74.6. Uh, this goes a whole lot quicker when you can edit, <laughs> so watching me scroll to find all these things, but it, it's in there somewhere, negative 74.6, and that's where this came from. So now at this point, it's just math. You know, you, you got to be real careful with your pluses and minuses here. So you got to be careful with your math. You miss one little negative sign, the whole thing goes haywire. But it's just adding and subtracting at this point and multiplying. So uh, 2 times negative one, uh, 285.83 is negative uh, 571.66. Negative 393.51 minus 571.66. Plus 74.6, because you subtract off a negative, the same thing as adding the positive there. Uh, so you add all that up, and you come up with negative 890.6 kilojoules. And that's delta H for this reaction. See, so that was a lot easier than Hess's Law, wasn't it? Okay. Now, is that endothermic or exothermic? Exothermic, negative delta H. Is that kind of exothermic or really exothermic? What's highly exothermic? Big number. See here. So knowing that's exothermic, what could we use natural gas for? Or fuel. See? And this is what all your fuels have in common. When you take a fuel and you burn it, it gives off heat, it gives off energy. And then you use that energy to do a lot of things. You can get a lot of energy per gram from natural gas and that's why we use it as a fuel you take it you burn it in your home it heats up the air you've got a blower that blows that hot air through your house and keeps your house nice and nice and warm you know when it's zero degrees outside that's the way it works okay so that's what all fuels pretty much have in common is you get a lot of energy it's very highly exothermic when you burn them per gram um, and uh, that makes them uh, quite useful gasoline you know, for example. But uh, yeah, that's that's how you do it. That's how you calculate uh, delta H uh, from heats of formation. Let's say, hypothetically, let's say I wanted to calculate the heat of formation for iron 3 plus, because not everything we deal with is a, is a compound. Sometimes we deal with ions. We deal with ions a lot, you know, in chemistry. Well, how would I calculate the uh, heat of formation for iron 3 plus? How would I measure it? Well, heat of formation is the formation of one mole from an element in their free state, stable state. So I'd take iron metal, and I'd change that to iron 3 plus, and I'd measure the amount of heat given off or taken in there. Can I do that? I can't do that. Why can't I do that? I'll give you a hint. What is the oxidation number of iron metal? 
What is the oxidation number of iron plus 3? Well, for iron male, it's 0, right? And for iron plus 3, it's 3 plus, plus 3. That's the oxidation number of monotonic ions charged the ion. Is that oxidation or reduction? It's oxidation. Oxidation is a loss of electrons or an increase in oxidation number. What do we know about redox reactions? Well, anytime you have oxidation, what? You have to have reduction, see? So that means there's another reaction going on along with that. So let's say you do that. You do a little redox reaction. You change your iron into iron 3+. plus. Okay, great. Well, some of my heat's coming from the iron going to iron 3+. plus. Some of it is coming from the other reduction step. How much of it is coming from the reduction step? Is it 50%? Is it 60%? Is it 20%? Do you see, because you, you can't have oxidation without reduction, you really can't measure one without the other. And if you can't measure one without the other, you don't know how much is on which. And so, therefore, I can't do this with ions, right? Well, you can if you set one particular, the heat of formation of one ion equals zero. All right, and that ion happens to be H+. Plus. Why H+, plus? that's what they chose. You know, I didn't, I didn't make the rules. That's just what they chose. Could have, actually could have chosen anything, but they chose H+. Plus. And so the heat of formation for H+, plus is, equal, is equal to zero. And that's just set equal to zero. If you set one of them equal to zero, you can generate all of them, a chart with all of them. If you don't set one of them equal to zero, you can't get anything. All right? So... There are two things I will not give you the heat of formation for. One is an element in its free state, normal state, which you should know is zero, and the other is H plus, zero. Everything else has a heat of formation. Okay, so how does it work? All right, well, look. Calculate delta H for the following reaction. Okay, I've got zinc plus 2H plus. I can put zinc in some acid here. Essentially, you've seen this reaction in the lab. And your zinc dissolves, so it's going to zinc 2 plus, and you see the bubbles, there's your hydrogen gas. Okay, well, delta H is equal to what? Well, it's equal to products minus reactants. So I'm going to look up the heat of formation for zinc 2 plus. That's here. I'm going to look up the heat of formation for H2. I'm going to add them together. That's the sum of the products. Okay, minus heat of formation for the zinc plus 2 times the heat of formation for H+. Plus. All right, products minus reactants. Okay, was well, there anything here we know is zero already? Well, I know the heat of formation for H2 is zero. Why? Because that's an element of free state. I know the heat of formation for zinc, metal, is zero, because that's an element of free state. And I know the heat of formation for H plus is zero, because I just told you the heat of formation for H plus is always zero. Okay, so if I cancel all those out, what's the only thing I have left? Well, delta H here is equal to the heat of formation for zinc 2 plus, which happens to be negative 153.9 kilojoules if you look in the back of the book in the appendix. Okay, now what you can do is instead of playing the game this way, we can play the game the other way around. What we can do is we can take this reaction, we can measure how much heat is given off. See, that's this number right here. And if we measure this amount of heat given off, we have just experimentally measured the heat of formation for zinc 2 plus. And that's where that value came from in the back of the book. See, we're assuming the H plus going to H2 is causing no heat change. And so therefore, all of the heat change in the reaction is going, is coming from the zinc going to the zinc 2 plus. And that's where this value is, is uh, we get this value from. I can pair another oxidation step with this H plus going to H2. That generates another value. I can pair another uh, cation forming with this H plus to H2. That generates another value. And so now I can list a whole host of different cations, and I have a bunch of heats of formations. Okay, well now I can turn around, and I can look at this heat of formation for zinc 2 plus here, and I can do like uh, zinc 2 plus going to zinc. I know this is... 
the heat coming from that, I can measure a reduction step. Zinc 1 to zinc 2 plus, actually. I can measure a reduction step that pairs with that. I can subtract off 153.9 of that. That must be how much heat's coming from my reduction step. And so now what I can do is I can start pairing oxidation and reduction steps together. And if I know one, I can subtract that off and I can get the other. And now what I can do is I can generate an entire chart of heats of formations for ions, like copper 2 plus, copper, copper 1 actually here as well. Um, see, here's a fluoride. Uh, there's OH minus. Uh, just, you know, tons and tons of ions here. You know, and I can do that if I set H plus equal to zero. There we go. H plus is zero. See? And if you look at any other ion in the chart, you'll find it's not zero. It's got a value. So I'll give you the values for the ions, except for H+, which you know is zero. I'll give you the values for compounds, which have a value. I don't expect you to memorize those. But if it's an element that's free state, you're on your own. You need to know that's zero. And if you can do that, um, I'll give you everything else. And that's how you calculate delta H's with heats of formation. Now, isn't that a whole lot easier than Hess's Law? Yeah, a lot easier than Hess's Law. So therefore, do you think this is a pretty useful thing, tool for a chemist? Pretty useful thing for a chemist. So yeah, I would. I think I would definitely know this. If you're going to miss something, miss something hard. Don't miss something easy. This is relatively easy, I guess. All right. Okay, well, hypothetical. What if I can't find the heat of formation for something? Let's say I've got four or five things in an equation like this, but I can't find the heat of formation for something. Any of them. One of them. Well, I'm kind of dead in the water at that point, right? So what am I going to do if I can't find a heat of formation for something? Because, you know, there's 100 million different compounds out there, and your chart's not 100 million columns long. You know, and, and it might be a compound that you made. You know, if you're in organic chemistry, you know, you may be the only person who's ever seen it. So, there, you know, there's probably no chart data on it. Well, here is a third way to calculate delta H. All right, and so this is actually in chapter, um, I believe it's in chapter 7. Um, I believe it's in chapter 7. Okay, and this one's called bond energies. And uh, I really like to pull that out and present that here because it fits in really, really well with what we're talking about. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and put it on this test. Uh, the, the good news is, I guess, you don't have to see it when you take your Chapter 7 test. So you got to see it anyway, so you might as well just see it now. All right, so let's talk a little bit about bond energies. Bond energies are a good way to estimate delta H when you don't have Hess's Law and you don't have heats of formation. All right, so how does that work? Well, the bond energy is the delta H when one mole of bonds are broken in the gaseous state. All right. Uh, why in the gaseous state? Well, in the gaseous state, your molecules are all very far apart from each other and separated. And so if you're in the gaseous state, you get a truer picture of how strong this bond is over here and how strong this bond is over here. Because if they're close to each other, now the molecules are attracting. You have to take that into account. And it's just a much more complicated situation. So the gaseous state gives you a truer picture of how much energy that bond really has. Um, so that's why. Okay. So for example, uh, here's Cl2. Uh, Cl2 is uh, two chlorine single bonds together. We'll talk about why later, but I would probably have to tell you that. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking that chlorine molecule here and we're breaking this bond right here. We're just snapping that bond right there. Okay, and we're forming two chlorine atoms. All right. To break a bond, you got to put energy in there. It takes energy to break that bond. Okay. So delta H for this reaction, break the bond energy for this reaction would be 243 kilojoules per mole. Okay. In other words, it, for to break one mole of chlorine chlorine single bonds little 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd little bonds, just breaking, breaking, breaking. Uh, it takes 243 kilojoules of energy to do that. All right. Nitrogen is found as a triple bond 
to triple bond nitrogen atoms. We'll talk about how and why later, but it is. Okay? And so if I want to break these two nitrogen atoms apart, I have to break a, a, a nitrogen nitrogen triple bond. Okay, and the bond energy for that's 941 kilojoules. All right, and again, these are found in a chart in chapter seven, actually, probably in strength 7.5, I believe, strengths of iron. Bond. So there you go. See, there's a whole chart of bond energies, and you see these, and some of them are a little more sophisticated, some of them are a little simpler. This is a fairly simple one, and that's uh, that's fine. It will uh, it will do what we need it to do. So, uh, and there's your bond energies. So, again, this is given to you. I don't make you memorize chart data. Uh, I will give you this on a test if you need it. Okay? Generally speaking, multiple bonds are stronger than single bonds. A double bond is usually stronger than a single bond, which makes sense. If you have two sticks bundled together, you know, it seems like that would be, uh, you know, harder to break uh, than if you just had one stick, right? Okay? So, your average carbon-carbon bond generally speaking, uh, it takes about 345 kilojoules per mole to break. If I broke one mole of little carbon-carbon bonds, I'd have to add three, uh, 345 kilojoules. How much energy do you think it would take to break uh, a mole of carbon-carbon double bonds? Well, common sense would tell you it would take twice as much because you're breaking twice as many bonds, right? So 2 times 345, so that would be what, about 690? Is it 690? No, it's only 611. How much would it take to break a carbon-carbon triple bond? Well, you'd think 3 times uh, 345, so we're probably, what, at 1,000-something? Well, no, it's only 837. Is a double bond stronger than a single bond? Yes. Is a triple bond stronger than a double bond? Yes. Is a double bond twice as strong as a single bond? No, it's less than twice as strong. Is a triple bond three times stronger than a single bond? No, it's not even close to three times stronger. But it is stronger. So I guess the question would be why? Why isn't a triple bond three times stronger than a single bond? Well, we'll talk about it later. Right? But generally speaking, yes, double bonds are stronger than single bonds, and triple bonds are stronger than double bonds. Just not two and three times stronger. We'll get to it. Trust me. Okay? All right. Again, that's all well and good, I guess, if you're breaking apart chlorine molecules. But, you know, that doesn't seem to be very useful, you know, for, for most reactions here. Um unless you knew this. It turns out that you can estimate delta H for any chemical reaction using this equation. Delta H for a reaction is equal to the sum of the bond energies of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bond, in, of the bond energies formed. Okay, so what this means is there, there's two ways that you can do a bond energy problem. The first way you can do it is you can just break the bonds that you need to break and just form the bonds that you need to form. Okay? And that will get you the correct answer. Um, that usually works really well when you're working with really, really large molecules uh, because what that does is that keeps the numbers down. So you're not worrying about, you know, 20,752 on this side and 16,525 on that side. Makes the math easier. Uh, the other way you can do this, and it will work equally well, is you can just bust everything to pieces. Break up everything. And then when you go over here on the other side, you form everything. And that will actually get the right answer as well. And, and the problem is the numbers tend to get kind of large. So when you're dealing with, with very small molecules, I like to just bust everything to pieces. That way you don't have to even think about it. Um, if, if I'm dealing with larger molecules, it's probably easier to just break what you need to break and just form what you need to form. All right, so let's see if we can do a problem here. So estimate delta H for the following reaction using bond energies. So I've got uh, N2 here plus 3H2 goes to 2NH3. Uh, this is uh, actually called the Haber process. This is a synthetic way to make ammonia. Uh, I'll tell you the story someday, but we're running a little long here. All right, so given this particular equation here, estimate delta H here. Okay, well, 
first thing I need to do is figure out, okay, what do I need to break here? Well, this is uh, N2. See, I've got two little nitrogens with a triple bond. Yeah, I would have to tell you at this point that it's, it's there, so don't worry about it. And I've got three H2. So here's one, two, three with single bonds here. Okay, and I'm forming two NH3s, which both look like this. Okay, so the first thing I got to do is if I want to make this look like this, I got to break some bonds. So what am I going to have to break? Well, I'm going to have to break these two nitrogens apart from each other because they're not together here. My hydrogens aren't connected either. So I'm going to have to break this one nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. So what I do is I go to my little chart over here that we looked at on uh, chapter 7. And I look for a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond somewhere in the chart. Um, he's in there somewhere. Um, there he is. 946 kilojoules per mole. All right. So we broke that. That's 946. Okay, I'm also going to have to break these three hydrogen-hydrogen single bonds because, see, my hydrogens aren't connected to each other anymore when I get over here. All right, so how much energy does it take to break a hydrogen-hydrogen single bond? Well, according to the chart, take my word for it, uh, 436. All right, but I need to break three of them, so I'm going to multiply that by three, and that gives me 1308. Okay. So the sum of my bonds broken, remember that sigma, that sum, just means adds. All it means is 946 plus 1308, so that's 2254 kilojoules. Okay, so that's how much energy I have to put in to break the bonds. All right, now breaking bonds takes energy, but when I form bonds, energy is released. Because remember we said that when you form compounds, the product is lower in energy than my reactants were here apart. So if it's lower in energy, that excess energy's got to go somewhere. Let's give it off in the form of heat. All right. So I go over here and I say, okay, well, how many bonds do I need to form? Well, I need to form one, two, three, four, five, six nitrogen hydrogen single bonds. So I'm going to look up a nitrogen hydrogen single bond in the chart, which is 390. And I'm going to multiply that by 6. And so that gives me 2,340 kilojoules. So then, this is how much energy I had to input. This is how much energy is released when my bonds form. All you got to do is take your bonds, broken minus bonds form. So 2254 minus 2340 uh, is equal to negative 86 kilojoules. And there's your delta H. No Hess's law. And that's another way that I can calculate delta H. So see, I've shown you three different ways that you can calculate delta H today. Uh, you can use, well, not today, but uh, we, you can use Hess's law. You can use heats of formation, and you can use bond energies. Now, bond energies seem pretty simple, and it seems like a lot more general, because you don't have to have charts of compounds or anything. That's just got to have bonds, right? So that seems like a pretty neat way to go. But it's kind of neat. Is there a disadvantage to using bond energies? Uh, yes. All right. The disadvantage of using bond energies is bond energies don't give you the exact answer. What they give you is they give you an approximate value. Okay. They give you a ballpark figure. Uh, in fact, if you actually calculated this reaction from heats of formation, you'll find it's actually negative 92. It's not negative 86. But is negative 86 in the ballpark? of negative 92, it, it's, it's, it's close. It's not exactly right, but it's close, right? So why don't bond energies work? Well, one problem you have here is not every carbon-carbon bond takes 345 kilojoules of energy to break. Some carbon, it depends not only on the bond, but also depends on what you have attached to the carbons here. You know, and that's going to cause this bond to either be stronger or weaker. Uh, so this value doesn't always hold. All right. On top of that, this value is also experimental. You, you have to measure this. You can look in other books and you might find a number that's actually different than 345. It'll probably be really close to 345, but you know, depending on what chart they got it from, it may be a slightly different value. The third reason why is, um, remember we said that bond energies are measured when one bond is, one mole of bonds is broken in the gaseous state. 
Do we always do our reactions in the gaseous state? No. We do reactions in aqueous quite often in water. Well, the water molecules are in there. The molecules are closer. That's going to cause uh, some differences there. You know, in the solid and the liquid, that's going to cause some differences because your molecules are very close together, and now they're going to attract each other, and that could cause some sort of a discrepancy in these bonds here as well. So bond energies give you an approximation of delta H, but they give you something that's kind of in the ballpark. What about Hess's law? Hess's law will give you the exact answer every time. Okay, how about del how about heats of formation? Heats of formation will give you the exact answer every time. So yes, heats of formation and Hess's law give you exact answers, and they're kind of preferred. Bond energies give you a ballpark figure, an estimation, but still not too bad. That's pretty close. All right, and you know if you don't have table data for heats of formations or equations for Hess's law. If this is all you got, this is all you got, I guess. All right. But it's just another way to calculate delta H. So see, I've shown you three ways to calculate delta H. You have no excuse for not being able to calculate delta H now. Um, you have three different ways. This is the only thing out of chapter seven you're responsible for on this particular test. And that's not too bad. Again, you know, I'd have to pretty much show you this at this point. Uh, but yeah, you, you this, is easy. this is a lot easier than Hess's law. So yeah, you want to be able to do that. Okay. All right, last thing, last thing in chapter five, and we're done, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the first law of thermodynamics really quickly. Uh, when we talk about the three rules of thermochemistry, you know, I said, uh, well, these are just the three rules I'm going to talk about. This actually is the first law of thermodynamics, which says energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Now, there's a lot of different ways you can say that, I guess, and this is one of those ways. Um, this delta U. Delta U, uh, I normally call it delta E. It's the change in energy, basically. Change in internal energy, technically. But it's the change in energy, okay? And uh, the change in energy here, or delta U, what they're calling this book, is equal to Q plus W. All right, so let me kind of break this down for you. Essentially, all they're saying is, okay, if I want to know how much energy something has, there's two things that kind of have an input there. One is Q, which if you'll remember, is the heat flowing in and out of a system. All right, if heat is flowing in, it's positive. If heat is flowing out, it's negative. Okay, the other thing that has a, a, a bearing on the total energy of a system is work. And that's work done on or by the system. Okay? Now, side note here. Um, I was a double, I was a physics and chemistry major. I was actually a double major. Uh, and so the interesting thing sometimes is you, you'll find two different people studying the same thing, but they're studying it from a different perspective and for different purposes. Um, normally, when a chemist studies thermodynamics, they're, they're interested in heat. Uh, they're interested in delta G, which is your spontaneity. You know, is this reaction going to react on its own or is it not? Uh, chemists are really big into, into Gibbs free energy. Um, things like that. All right. A, a physicist, usually when they study thermodynamics, they're interested in work. You know, I've got a gallon of gasoline. You know, a chemist says, how much heat's given off when I burn this gasoline? A physicist or an engineer says, I got a big giant load of bricks. How far up can I lift this bricks using the energy in the gasoline? So the, the physicist is more interested in what can the gasoline do for me? The chemist is more interested in what's happening in the gasoline. It, you're looking at the same thing. You're just looking at it for different reasons. Okay. So I, I say all that to say this, the sign convention in chemistry for work is the exact opposite of the sign convention in physics. And the books won't tell you that, but when you look at equations, you'll see if that's really true. In chemists, we're more interested in the system. All right. So let's say, for example, uh, you know, I've decided that we're, we got a big giant pile of bricks outside the Fox building. We need to carry those over to the science faculty building. So everybody get you an armful of bricks and let's carry them across. Okay. What is work? Well, work is a force. 
uh, applied over a certain distance, right? So if you pick up those bricks and you walk across the parking lot, then I guess you're doing work. Uh, how do you feel after that? You feel good? You feel all energetic? You know, you're tired. Why? Well, because you expended energy, right? You have less energy at the end than you did at the beginning. So if work is done by the system, the sign convention here, that's going to be negative. Okay? If work is done on the system, then something else is putting energy into the system. Work is going to be positive. And physics is actually the other way around. They won't tell you that, but there's a way you can tell. You can look, but that's, that's pretty much what's going on there. All right. So in here, we're more interested in the system itself. If, if delta U is positive, then that means the system has more energy at the end than it had at the beginning. If uh, delta U is negative, then that means the system has less energy at the end than it had at the beginning. So it's kind of like your bank account. You know, there are things you can do to increase your bank account. There are things to do to decrease your bank account. All right. In this case, there's two things here, and that's Q and W. All right. So that's the sign convention. All right, see if you can do this problem. A system does 50 joules of work, has 120 joules of heat added to it, and then does 150 joules of work again. What is delta U for the system? Okay, well, delta U is equal to Q plus W. So um, here's Q, has 120 joules of heat added to it. Is that going to be positive 120 or negative 120? That's going to be positive 120, because if heat's flowing in, it's like, it's like making a deposit in your bank account. You now have more money than what you started with, right? So that's positive 120. All right. If the system does 50 joules of work, is that going to be positive 50 or negative 50? Well, that's negative 50, because the system is doing work. It's expending energy, so it has less. It's like writing a $50 check. You know, you don't have, you have $50 less in your bank account. Uh, so minus 50, and then does 150 joules of work again. So that's another negative 150, see? So we added 120 joules here. We got rid of 200 joules when we did the work, okay? So if you made a $120 deposit, and then you wrote two checks totaling $200, is your bank account better or worse? Well, you're $80 in the hole, see? So delta U here is negative 80. In other words, the system has lost a net 80 joules, kilojoules of heat here. Kilojoules of energy, actually, not even heat. Kilojoules of energy. Make sense? So, yeah, it's just a sign convention thing and being able to add and subtract. You know, uh, don't miss that. Good Lord, don't miss that. But you got to keep your signs straight. And, and it all kind of comes down to, um, you know, uh, just think of it in terms of what's happening to the system. Is my system gaining energy or is it losing energy? Positive if it's gaining, negative if it's, if it's not. And the sign convention makes sense. Okay? Okay, well, bear with me on this part right here because I, I, I do have a punchline. <laughs> there, is a, there is something I'm going for here, so just kind of hang with me here. So let's talk about work here. All right, so what actually is work in, according to uh, physics? Well, work is a force applied over a certain distance. So let's say, for example, uh, I get back here and I decide I'm going to push that wall. And I get back there and I push and I push and I push and I push. And I'm sweating and I'm just, I'm just, you know, just drained by the time I, and I push for 30 minutes. Just really, really tired. Have I done any work? Well, I've spent a lot of energy, but have I done any work? No, I haven't done any work. Why have I not done any work? Well, because the wall hasn't moved. To be able to do work, you have to exert a certain force, which I, apparently I'm doing, but that, that has to make something move a certain distance. Have you ever known people who just expend a lot of energy, but they don't really do any work? Yeah, well, there you go. Don't really accomplish anything. See? So you have to have a force, but you also have to be able to move something a certain distance for it to actually qualify as work. All right? Well, when you're dealing with a gas, this equation applies. Work is equal to negative P times delta V, where P is the pressure of a gas, and delta V is your change in volume. All right. In physics, by the way, you won't see the negative. That's how you know a sign convention is, is the opposite, actually. Okay. But here's the, the negative is here because of our sign convention we chose up there. 
So let's say I've got a, a this is like a car here, maybe a little gas piston here. I've got a gas down here. Here's my little piston. So I hit that uh, gasoline vapor with my spark plug, and it explodes. That's what gas does. It doesn't burn. It actually explodes. And so my gas starts expanding. All right, well, what's that going to do to the piston? Well, it's going to push the piston up, right? That's how a gas, that's how a little um, four-stroke cycle engine, uh, internal combustion engine works. Okay? So, is my gas doing work? Well, yes, it's applying a force and it's moving something a distance. So, let's think about that in terms of what's my force? Well, does it make sense to you that the more pressure I have here, the more force is pushing up on this piston? Okay? So my force is the gas pressure pushing up on the piston. Does it make sense to you that the more my gas expands, the further this piston goes up? And so that's kind of my distance. So see, this is really force times distance, delta V, the change in pressure, uh, change in volume here of my gas. Large change in volume, piston goes up a lot. Small change in volume, piston goes up a little. All right, so it's really just this. The negative is here simply because my gas now has less energy after it's done all that work uh, than it did before. So therefore, work is negative. So that's where the minus is. Don't worry too, too much about it. Okay? All right. Now, where am I going with all this? Well, you remember when we were doing bomb calorimeter problems? I was really careful to say, what is Q for the reaction? Did I say what was delta H for the reaction when I did the bomb calorimeter problem? No, I didn't. Why did I do that? In a bomb calorimeter, remember your, your bomb is rigid. It's, it's solid. So when you explode a gas or whatever in the bomb, does the bomb actually do this? No, it stays rigid. So in a bomb calorimeter, what you're dealing with is you're dealing with a constant volume process. The volume of the bomb doesn't change. So delta V there is equal to zero. Okay? But we know that delta U is equal to Q plus W, right? And we know that work is equal to negative P times delta V. Well, if my change in volume here is zero, pressure times zero is equal to what? Zero. Anything times zero is zero, right? So that means my work done here is zero. So if that's the case, what's delta U equal to? It's equal to Q. So in other words, in a bomb calorimeter, you're not measuring delta H. You're actually measuring delta U. And that's why I didn't say what's delta H for the reaction, because it's not a delta H. Delta H is defined as Q at constant pressure. And that would be like your coffee cup calorimeter, because remember, that's kind of open atmosphere there. So you have you know, a constant pressure situation rather than a constant volume situation. So, moral of the story is, when you're doing a coffee cup calorimeter problem there, which is constant pressure, you're actually measuring delta H. When you're doing a bomb calorimeter problem, technically, you're not measuring delta H. You're actually measuring delta U, because that's a constant volume process. Now, is there an equation that you can use to go from delta U to delta H? Yes, there is, actually, and it, uh, it's some big, long equation, and it has something to do with changing moles of gas, actually. The more moles of gas you have, the more, uh, the more delta U and delta H differ. If there's no change in moles of gas, they're actually the same. Okay, but if there is, then, yeah, you got to do that. Is that something you're responsible for? No, not something you're responsible for. Don't worry about it. All right, but it's, I suppose, worth knowing. That in a bomb calorimeter, technically you're measuring delta U, not delta H. In a coffee cup calorimeter, you're actually measuring delta H directly. And you can go between the two. We're just not going to. All right. And if you can remember that from that section, that's, uh, that's close enough. All right. Okay. Uh, that's chapter five. So that's thermochemistry. So we'll quit there. Uh, we'll start with chapter six next time. So uh, I guess I will see you then. Bye.